Welcome to the Big Bets on Campus podcast presented by BetMGM. The college baseball postseason is set. The bracket, all 64 teams, all 16 hosts for the regionals, which get started on Friday, May 31st, running through June 3rd. That leads into the Super Regionals, which is college baseball's version of the Sweet 16. And then it's who gets to punch their ticket to Omaha for the World Series the de facto elite eight on the diamonds, a lot of excitement here on selection Monday, and we're going to get started with the best expert in college baseball. And that was Colin Wilson. He's going to walk us through a whole bunch of different angles to look at the field and, you know, these different regional hosts, who's most vulnerable, who are some interesting long shots, but let's get started with the bracket itself, Colin winners and losers of the seeding draw. And before I kick it to you, it's important to note baseball America tweeted this out. There's a serious issue if you're not a top eight seed. Since expansion in 2018, seeds nine through 16 have made it to the College World Series just five times. That's just less than 13%. And of those five teams, three were the nine seed. So generally speaking, if you're a 10 through a 16, you were on upset alert starting in the very beginning here in the regionals. They went just two for 35 on their trips to Omaha. All right, so what are your thoughts on the winners and losers of Selection Monday? Yeah, I got a pair of winners and a pair of losers here, but I'm going to start off with my Arkansas Razorbacks. They are on my winners list. This is a team that severely struggled down the stretch, can't score any runs. Nobody can pitch outside of Hagen Smith. So what do they do? They let them host a regional, and they send Louisiana Tech, Kansas State, who's not supposed to be in this tournament, and Southeast Missouri State. Now, there's no prior history to any of this, but these teams, these comp- these opponents, Louisiana Tech, Kansas State coming to Fayetteville, they're just not going to be able to match up with Arkansas. Arkansas is going to get a mulligan for their offense. They're going to be able to play with Mason Molina and Brady Tigert as the second and third starter and get away with not having them be accurate. Uh, They haven't been able to locate. They've been very hittable. And Arkansas is going to get away with it with probably one of the easiest draws out there. From a losing perspective, I think North Carolina, any futures we may have on them may be in trouble because they are going to send, we talked about this, they reloaded this year with a bunch of freshman pitchers. And now those freshman pitchers, specifically Jason DeCaro, might have to go head to head in his first game against reigning national champion LSU, who is on a heater right now. Calabrese, who you got as winner or loser? Uh, I would say, you know, the fact that you circled North Carolina right away, I agree. I mean, the SEC is sending 11 teams. They should be a winner of the entire draw in terms of the field. But the fact of the matter is not only do they have 11 teams in, they have a lot of hot teams in the field at this point. We'll get to your Vandy boys a little bit later. But I agree, LSU getting paired up in the Chapel Hill Regional, that's a loser situation. I also like Dallas Baptist as a winner, getting to go to Tucson. If you look at the market right now, they're actually the favorite to win that regional out West. And I think that was the conversation we had for many weeks leading up. Who are the teams that are going to get a shot at these you know, Pac-12 paper tigers? At least that's what we've been calling them. And Dallas Baptist has been fortunate to be one of those teams. Yeah, I'm right there with you. My last set of winner and loser came down to winner. Vanderbilt, I know we're going to talk about the Vandy boys later, but hey, Something people may not realize, Tim Corbin, the head coach of Vanderbilt, just saw head coach Eric Bakich in the 2019 championship round at the College World Series when Eric Bakich was coaching Michigan. Vandy didn't have any problem winning that little two out of three series in the 2019 championship round. So you give a leg up to Vanderbilt getting stuck in the Clemson regional. And then from a loser perspective, you already mentioned it. Arizona is the big loser here. Yeah, they get to host. Good for you. But you've taken losses. Two losses to Grand Canyon, who's the number four seed in your regional. And you've also also taken a loss to Dallas Baptist, who also is in your regional. The Wildcats have the worst offensive metrics of anybody in this Tucson regional. And they've lost to two of the three other teams. So it's just bad news all over for Arizona in this regional. All right, Colin, feel free to jump back in and slam North Carolina for the answer for this question. Most vulnerable top eight seed, in your opinion, It's interesting, since 99, almost two-thirds of regionals have been won by the host team, but last year, they were snake bits. Seven of them flamed out in the regionals despite hosting. Do you think we're going to see a similar situation this year where a lot of teams struggle to win on their home diamond? And if so, what's a top eight seed that you think is ripe to fall? Yeah, I think there are going to be some upsets here, and I'm going to head out to Charlottesville where I think Virginia is in some trouble with Mississippi State coming to town. Anytime you got a number two seed or a three seed that's from the SEC coming, they're probably hot. They probably just slipped in with RPI, and Mississippi State checks all those boxes. 
in the early markets, Calabrese, you know, they they're already listed as the favorite in this regional and they're not even the host. That's going to be a real problem. This is a team that has started to come alive. They showed signs of it in the penultimate weekend against Arkansas, almost taking that series against the Razorbacks. Then they got hot in the SEC tournament in Hoover. They lost their last two games to Vanderbilt and Tennessee, each by a single run. Mississippi State could easily be SEC champions right now, and they're just a couple years removed from being national champions. So um, there's a really good chance. Uh, odd, odds makers know this. They've already listed them as the favorite, and they're not even the regional host. So I think Virginia's in big trouble. For first timers watching college baseball and this double elimination format in the four team pods, it's critical to understand that the first game carries so much weight because if you lose and you have to go through the loser's bracket, that is a minefield that very few teams are able to navigate. In total, just three of the last 64 regional winners have come out of the loser bracket. So if a two, three, or four gets a win right out of the gate, gets hot, it's absolutely possible for them not only to win, but to go on a run in this tournament. Who's a two, three, or four most likely to advance to the super regionals, in your opinion? Well, we're going to go with Florida. And we said this on the podcast for weeks. If the Gators get into this field, which I didn't think they were, there were some bubble teams that got popped. There were some teams that made you know big runs in their conference tournaments. Florida still made it in. And now you're going to send them to Stillwater. This is a regional over the years that has produced huge scores. Arkansas, Missouri State, Oklahoma State, these are teams that have come into Stillwater and posted 20 runs in a single game. Now you're going to take Jack, Jack Cagley and Un. And you're going to take Florida, who is seventh in the nation in home runs per game. And you're going to put that power in Stillwater. All we need is a little bit of that Oklahoma wind. And Florida may be hitting the ball all the way to the Arkansas border. But O'Brate Stadium is a place not for pitchers. It's for hitters. That is Florida's game right now. They have struggled with pitching all season long. They don't have to worry about that when they get to Stillwater because everybody's going to struggle with pitching. So give me Florida as a three seed to upset. We've touched on these three conferences already. The SEC, the Pac-12, and their swan song here, their last go-around before. It's just Oregon State and Washington State and the ACC. As a three-pack, they have won every single national title since 2009, with the exception of Coastal Carolina. If you had to pick it right now, obviously you take those three conferences and you don't choose the the remainder on the board. But does anyone outside of those power three, quote-unquote, have an opportunity to win the Natty? I don't think so. And if you go back to historical reasons, when you look at the SEC and what they've done, dating back to 2017, 12 teams have played in the championship round and nine of them were SEC teams. Nine of 12 teams since 2017 have been SEC teams competing for the national title. I did a little quick bracket before we came on here. I couldn't get around Tennessee and Georgia being in the finals. Now we know that number one's overall seeds have serious issues with Omaha and getting the championship round. So I'm sure my picks will change. But if you're going to slot two SEC teams all the way to the finals here, I don't think that's a very bad move considering what they've done historically. All right. Speaking of that, who is your title game prediction? And I'll add a little bit of window dressing here. Number one seeds have finished second in this tournament as a runner-up Texas in 2004 and 2009 and reached the College World Series in 14 of the last 23 tournaments. But Miami was the last one to win it, going you know from number one all the way to Omaha and winning the national championship. They did it all the way back in 1999. It's been 25 years. Should the Vols feel like they're due or should it feel like you know an albatross hanging around their neck? I, I think Tennessee is in a good position mentally after what happened in the SEC tournament. And if nobody was watching... All the top teams got booted quick. Kentucky, Arkansas, Tennessee took early loss. Texas A&M got booted. And then Tennessee had to fight through a bunch of hungry teams, including Vanderbilt, Mississippi State, LSU. And they ended up winning the SEC championship just by a single run, one of the most dramatic tournaments that I've seen. So Tennessee's headspace has got to be pretty good heading into this. I did fill out this bracket with a very light number two pencil that can be erased immediately because you never want to take the number one overall seed. But I do think Tennessee and the other team that's the hottest at the plate than anybody, Georgia, who actually did get into a super regional seed. I think those are the two that are going to meet up with each other. But I could make a case that Mississippi State's going to beat Arkansas and then Mississippi State's going to give Tennessee problems. I could make a case for a lot of SEC teams, but right now it's Georgia. The biggest outdoor cocktail party is going to happen in baseball this year. That's who I've got penciled into the finals. All right, going SEC on SEC for a title game. 
that's I think certainly within the bounds and we've watched it all season long. There's been incredible, you know, game being played down there. Teams are playing their way into fighting shape. You've seen it with Florida making it into the tournament, LSU surging, Georgia, who you mentioned numerous times on the podcast. They're not the same team that they were in February and March. And for that reason, you have to take them seriously to make a deep run. So having an SEC, you know, battle for the title makes sense. But in terms of building a portfolio here, there's still time to, you know, throw a couple darts. Hope a team gets to Omaha. Who do you think is the best value right now in this field of 64? Yeah, right now, as we're recording this, I think Dallas Baptist plus 275 to win the Tucson Regional is the best bet that's on the board. Their starting pitcher, their ace anchor, Ryan Johnson, is one of the best in the nation. The guy has racked up over, I think, 140 strikeouts and 100 innings. It's, it's pretty amazing what he has been able to do. But statistically, if you look at all the teams, Arizona, West Virginia, Grand Canyon, and Dallas Baptist, only one of them has a complete resume from, uh, you talk about road right? you, road uh, strength of schedule, you talk about road RPI, you talk about slugging, you talk about what the pitching staff does. It's all Dallas Baptist, and they do play a pretty tough non-conference schedule. Like I said, they've already beaten Arizona twice here. So plus 275 on a Dallas Baptist Patriots team that's beaten this regional host twice. Yes, please. That's the value that I want right now. All right, let's close this up with a softball question for the casuals out there. If they're tuning in for the first time, haven't watched college baseball all year, who are the two appointment television starters that you want them to watch? And who are the two guys in the lineup that maybe time your bathroom break for later because you want to see these guys hit? Well, you're going to see Charlie Condon from Georgia hit. And you're going to see Jack Caglione from Florida hit. There, there's no other two names. You know, Maybe I can make a case for uh, Oregon State. There's a couple of players there in that lineup. They're going to go to the MLB. But those are the two offensive players that you absolutely don't want to miss. And then I'm going to rely on my guy, Hagan Smith at Arkansas. I still believe he is the best pitcher in the game. He is a mold of Randy Johnson, long, lanky lefty that throws, you know, pitches, sliders and, and cutters that no one can hit. So uh, I'm going to stick with Hagan Smith as much watch TV. He should have no problems with La Tech, SEMO. I don't know who the Kansas State. I mean, it's just going to be fodder for Hagan Smith this weekend. So I'll make that my appointment viewing. I'm thinking Santucci, if he's actually healthy for Duke, you know, he's certainly somebody who has the highest ceiling of all the pitchers in the ACC, at least in my opinion, and someone that, you know, the Blue Devils could hitch their wagon to and hopefully go on a deep run. What are your thoughts on Duke getting off the mat after kind of closing the season a bit of a thud? They weren't 100 percent healthy. Yeah, I think I think Duke was extremely upset with what's happened. I think they've been overlooked. North Carolina wrapping up that ACC regular season title pretty quick. A lot of love for Clemson, a lot of love for Florida State. Duke just was not having it in the ACC uh, conference tournament. They really made a statement, and they did it without Jonathan Santucci, their number one starter who was out with a rib injury. He should be back here for regionals. I think Duke is out to make a statement, and they're, they're going to be so upset that they are not a regional host and passed over. Uh, they're going to be able to do a lot of damage here. So if Jonathan Santucci is healthy, Duke is a really hard team to pass up and wagering on regionals. For Colin Wilson, I'm Mike Calabrese. This has been the Big Bets on Campus podcast presented by BetMGM. We now have a field of 64 ready for college baseball, so make sure to tune in on the regionals starting on Friday, May 31st, leads into the Super Regionals, and then the first day of the College World Series is on Friday, June 14th. So the action's going to be hot and heavy and coming at you every single week all the way through let's call it the end of June 23rd, 24th, if necessary, if it goes to three games there in the national title game. We're going to be back every single week walking you through what you need to know, futures, starters, teams to fade, and live betting opportunities. So thanks so much for listening, and we'll catch you soon.